my name is Pat Fitzsimmons. I'm uh, chair for the Comprehensive Planning Committee. Um, tonight we have kind of a, a special meeting in that uh, it's more of an educational meeting for uh, the town of Saugerties. Uh, we're going to have two presenters tonight. Uh, we're going to uh, videotape this so that it can be played on channel 23 over the next couple of months. Uh, before we get into our presenters, I would like to just take a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, and do some of our normal business when we start our meetings. Um, the first thing is we have to uh, take a look at the minutes from our 24th of May meeting. Every uh, member of the committee has a copy. I wish you would take a few seconds here to uh, review this and uh, give us a chance to uh, discuss whatever changes you want to make. Do we have any amendments or discussion items for the minutes from the uh, last meeting? I just Go ahead. To ask a question. Um, which is near a designated historic house? Where is that? Zone 32. I forgot the name of it. Oh, that's the name of the house. Oh, okay. the one house, right? You're going to add that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other um, discussion items or amendments to the minutes? Well, Bob is the building it, but I guess I didn't have it. No, but that's all right. But thank you, Bob. I'd uh, like to uh, have a motion to accept the amended minutes. So moved. Second. Second by Barry. All in favor of accepting the minutes, the amended minutes? Aye. Aye. Nobody opposed? Thank you. Now's the time we're, we've been looking for. Hold on. Yes? Yeah, I'd just like to say I'd like to thank the members of the public who showed up, all three of them. <laughs> I think that shows through a lot of interest in what's going on. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Uh, the real thanks may come uh, months down the road when people start getting a chance to look at this on Channel 23. Uh, so what I would like to do is get started. Uh, you want to sit down front? Okay. Uh, if anybody has trouble uh, with being able to see the screen or anything or here, uh, we have some seats here in the front, so it might be easier for you to see the screen. Uh, now, as we get started with this, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Laura Hetty. She's from uh, Hudson River Estuary Biodiversity Outreach Coordinator. That's what her position is with Hudson River Estuary Program. Uh, she has done a number of uh, presentations on uh, why we have to save our water resources, and I think she has some very 
very pertinent information to provide the people of Socrates. So, Laura? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Where do I need to... Can I stand up here? Where do I need to be using light? Because it's everywhere here, right? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, this, this is a garden, but that's where you want to stand. Or? Take the mic right do I need to use the mic for the purpose of filming? Yes. Yeah. I do? Oh. I hope I'm not too loud. Action. Is that, is that all right? Okay. All right. So uh, I apologize. I, it looked like the title slide for some reason was wrong. But in any case, uh, thanks so much for inviting me uh, to come tonight. I'm, I don't want to block. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm always happy to talk with communities about how to conserve resources at the local level. It's one of our uh, priorities at the Hudson River Estuary Program which, for those of you not familiar, is a program at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation at the DEC. And the estuary program um, has a, a number of uh, goals. But our core mission is really to ensure clean water, and wetlands are really important for that purpose, um, protect and restore habitats. Again, wetlands are an important uh, part of that. Um, provide water recreation, river access, that's a little bit more focused on the Hudson River. Um, you know, help communities adapt to climate change, whether you're a shorefront community uh, and dealing with sea level rise and, and tidal waters increasing at the shoreline, that's one adaptation to climate change that some communities in the Hudson Valley are going to uh, need to um, confront. But also inland, in the watershed of the Hudson Valley, wetlands are going to be important for helping hold flood water. Um, we'll talk about that, um, and particularly as we see more rainfall due to climate change. And finally, one of the final pieces of the mission of the Hudson River Estuary Program is to conserve our world-famous scenery. And uh, we were really happy to be able to give a grant to the town of Saugerties many years ago to help fund the open space plan for um, the town of Saugerties. And that, of course, addressed things like habitat, uh, open space protection, scenery protection, and so forth. So we really um, appreciate when communities reach out to us and say, we would love you know, some assistance or some help or some training, or some maps, anything that we can do to kind of help you fulfill the, these missions that we have for the entire Hudson Valley. And we work in the 10 counties along the tidal portion of the river. And the work I do specifically is developing trainings for planning boards, for comprehensive plan uh, you know, groups like yourselves, open space commissions, um, but also providing technical assistance, maps, data, um, and, and so forth. Okay, so for tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what is a wetland. Um, there's different definitions. I just want to keep it kind of simple so we're all on the same page. Um, talk a little bit about the wetlands here in Ulster County. Uh, talk, most importantly, about the value and function of wetlands. What do we have to lose if we don't pay attention and protect and conserve our wetlands? And, and conclude with that idea of conserving our wetland resources. So what is a wetland? Next slide. Um, when we talk about defining a wetland, you know, you might be talking about a legal definition from a protection standpoint, uh, or you might have a very complex ecological definition if you're uh, a scientist. But for the purposes of, of our needs, we generally talk about wetlands as having three uh, components. The presence of water, and the water might be there part of the year, the water might be there um, all year long, but uh, it's not a requirement that there's water present throughout the entire year. It can be for a shorter period. There's also unique soils that are different from the soils in adjacent what we call upland or non-wetland areas. And those soils have properties that are typical of wetlands, like peat soils or muck soils. And then vegetation that grows there is the third, the third piece of that definition. And the vegetation is very adapted to growing in those wet conditions. You know, for those of you who garden or have house plants, you know that if you overwater a plant that doesn't like to have really soggy roots, it's going to turn yellow and probably wilt and die because that plant isn't adapted to those sorts of wet conditions. Um, and wetland soils generally hold water and stay pretty saturated. So the plants that grow there are really adapted to those conditions. So we see um, characteristics and vegetation and um, diversity in wetlands that are different than what you're going to see in an upland forest, or an upland meadow, or a different kind of uh, habitat. Next slide. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the different kinds of wetlands in Ulster County. And if you gave me an hour tonight, I could easily just talk about the wetlands in Ulster County because we have so many great um, different kinds. But I just wanted to hit on a few just to help illustrate um, how diverse wetlands are. Well, here's a list of some of the ones I could talk about tonight. Uh, wet clay meadow, wet meadow, fens, 
hardwood swamps, and, and the list goes on. But I'm going to focus on just a few of the more common ones. Next slide. Here's a classic emergent marsh. Uh, you're probably familiar with the term marsh. Often think of uh, areas with cattail, or um, here we have, um, there's actually cattail mixed with a lot of purple loosestrife. But in marshes, what's characteristic about the vegetation in a marsh is that it's actually emerging out of the water. That's why it's called an emergent marsh. And there's areas that have vegetation, there's areas of open water, and these are uh, wetland types that often are good for waterfowl, um, different ducks you'll find here, uh, turtles, frogs, fish if, there's, if the water is deep enough. And generally, emergent marshes have more standing water than some of the other wetland types um, I'm going to talk about. Next slide. Riparian wetlands are very important. And these are the wetlands that are along our streams, along our stream corridors. You know, riparian refers to our stream and river corridors. And riparian wetlands are those wetlands that are along the edges of streams and enable streams to swell when we get heavy rainfalls and, and there's a lot more water flowing through the stream channel than normal. And they um, kind of buffer the effects of those increased water levels. And they're, they kind of create a... Um, um, a zone between our upland areas and our wet areas. And they're very important. And I think people tend to think of our riparian areas or our streams as almost like a linear feature on the, uh, on the landscape. You know, if you, if you draw it on a map, it's a blue line, just like a road, you might draw a black line. But streams aren't like that. They're not a discrete feature. They actually swell and they contract and they move. And, and having these wetlands that are naturally occurring along stream corridors enable those streams to go through those natural changes water levels, and also are really important for the wildlife that uh, live along streams. Here's a, a hardwood swamp. A lot of people use the term swamp just to, you know, kind of as a synonym for wetland. Oh, it's a big swampy area, you know, there's nothing back there but swamp. But really, swamp is a technical term that refers to wetlands that are dominated by trees. So you have uh, a canopy of trees or shrubs, but woody vegetation. Unlike that marsh where you had plants growing out of the water, we're now talking about the big woodier vegetation. And this is down where I live, in Rosendale. Um, and this was a really special hardwood swamp because it also had conifers growing in it. And it was kind of a mix of deciduous and, and conifer trees growing in this particular swamp. And this one had um, red-shouldered hawk, or yeah, red-shouldered hawk and barred owl. Bears used to travel through it because it was a really nice, big, large uh, swamp area. And one of my favorites, a much smaller uh, wetland, are woodland pools, also called vernal pools because of the fact they show up in the springtime when they really hold a lot of uh, spring rain and, and snow melt. But these are uh, pools that are only filled intermittently. They only have water for part of the year, generally um, late winter, early spring, through uh, midsummer, and they're very important for breeding amphibians. So a lot of our, even when the snow is still on the ground, like in, in late March, a lot of our forest salamanders, like spotted salamander, um, the wood frog, they travel from their forest habitat by the hundreds into these pools for breeding purposes. They lay their eggs, they, the adults go back out into the forest, and then these pools are like nurseries for all these amphibians to develop. And um, one of my colleagues who does woodland pool uh, monitoring throughout the Hudson Valley said she just this week saw the wood frogs are starting to finally leave the pools, and they're very tiny, they still have a little stump where their tail had been when they were still swimming around in the water. So they're really... Uh, they look pretty uh, insignificant when you're walking through the forest, but they're really a hotbed of life. And, you know, before you know it, come August, they'll be dry, you know, in a typical year. And you might walk through the woods and not even realize that there had been this wetland there. And so this is an example of a wetland that's not, you know, not necessarily present with water year-round. And finally, another example, um, this is a wet meadow. And here's another classic example of a wetland type that you might walk, you know, walk by on a path or drive by in your car and think it really just looks like a meadow, not necessarily that it's wet. But if you were to get out and really tromp around and look at the vegetation, in this case you can see some of the sedges that are, are classically, you know, associated with wetlands, also a lot of purple loosestrife. And you'd also feel that the ground is kind of bumpy because the different plants have raised roots and form kind of uh, hummocks. And, um, and also it's spongy a little bit too because the ground is wet, but it doesn't hold standing water like you would see in a marsh. So the reason I'm talking about these different wetlands is just to kind of help paint the picture of how they're all very different in terms of the vegetation they're going to support, in terms of the wildlife they support, and the functions they may provide to us on the landscape. So, so you know, I applaud um, Socrates years ago. You guys worked on the biodiversity assessment project where you mapped habitats. 
and it gave you a visual map of where all different habitats occur in the town of Socrates, and that can help inform the planning decisions you make, and so it gives you an idea of the kinds of diversity you have, and, and that'll help later on with wetland conservation. Okay, so let's talk about those values and functions of wetlands. Next slide. Um, back, now it's, it's over two years ago, our um, state comptroller, Thomas DiNapoli, put out a white paper, The Economic Benefits of Open Space Protection, and, or pr preservation, and I bring up a quote from this just to remind communities that are thinking about wetland conservation or open space protection that there are economic benefits to conserving these important areas. And this quote I thought really resonated when we talk about wetlands. He said, in many instances, it is less expensive for a community to maintain open space that naturally maintains water quality, reduces runoff, or controls flooding than to use tax dollars for costly engineered infrastructure projects such as water filtration plants and storm sewers. And wetlands are one of the key components of our natural landscape that can contribute to water quality, contribute to uh, preventing runoff and erosion. And so really it's a very proactive, um, you know, economic, economically beneficial uh, endeavor to think about conserving wetlands at the local level. And I'm gonna show some examples. Uh, again, I could also talk for a whole hour, if not you know, many, about the benefits of wetlands. Next slide. So I'm gonna, I, 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 I like to draw some analogies to things we all are familiar with when I talk about wetlands. Um, because I, I should give a caveat, I'm not a wetland scientist. I've studied conservation biology. Um, but wetlands really fit into the way our whole natural systems work. So much like the kidneys in our bodies filter out all the bad stuff, wetlands have a way of filtering out the bad stuff in our natural systems. Next slide. So wetlands can remove metals out of um, out of water. Wetlands, uh, when they you know they hold water and it can sit in the wetland and slowly filter into the ground if it's if if um, the water is moving through to the groundwater, and in doing so it can trap and retain sediment that maybe you know got into the wetland as the as rainwater flooded through um, uh, an area and ended up in the wetland. It also can eliminate nitrogen, which is important in. Um, you know, particularly in agricultural areas or communities, maybe where there's a lot of fertilizers and things like that. Next slide. And I don't want to get too heavy into all the science, but if, uh, you know, just looking at some of the different research that's been done, we see that different kinds of wetlands perform uh, different services. In Ontario, they found natural marshes were found especially to be good at assimilating landfill leachate. Uh, floodplain wetlands were found to be particularly good at retaining phosphorus. Wetlands with high organic substrates, high densities of those submerged aquatic plants, well submerged, in this case underwater, were very good at removing pesticides. So again, getting back to the idea of all those different diverse wetlands, the different kinds of plants growing there, the different kinds of hydrology, that can maybe affect the kinds of services they provide to us naturally by filtering our, filtering our water. Next slide. So a regional example that I know is, is, isn't always um, entirely popular within the drinking water um, Watershed, but I, I, it's an internationally um, discussed example of how natural systems provide the benefits that would otherwise be performed by a built system. It's our New York City drinking water supply system, um, or the New York City water supply system. You know, provides drinking water for nearly half of New York's residents, 90% of the folks in the city. Next slide. And when the, D, the Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, not the agency I'm from, um, had to consider ways to make sure the water in the reservoir system was clean enough for drinking water, they could have spent in the neighborhood of six to eight billion dollars to build an artificial filtration plant. Or there was the option of protecting the watershed, conserving uh, lands and managing lands. And um, they chose that, and if you hit the button one more time, they chose this option, which was cheaper, and it's cost, I think it, it was approximately in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or, or maybe a little more, there's been about $2 billion spent on protecting lands that actually act as that natural filtration service and clean the water without having to build that filtration plant, which, by the way, would also require annual maintenance, uh, which was in the millions of dollars. So here's a great example of how natural systems were protected to provide a service that's very important to our human communities, clean drinking water. Next slide. Okay, so kidneys, wetlands are like kidneys. They're also like bathtubs in the way they can hold water, which is so important. Um, you know, with Irene and Lee, those were extreme catastrophic storm events. But we do see trends of more precipitation, more extreme precipitation events due to climate change, and having the ability to hold 
water somewhere without it just flooding our communities is really important, and wetlands can provide that service. They slow down flood water. They also can hold it and store it, and like I mentioned earlier, let it slowly seep into the ground. And that's so important. Um, and for those of you not familiar, that's the town of New Falls during a you know, typical spring rainstorm event. That bridge crosses the Wall Kill, and out beyond the bridge is the Wall Kill Flats, what we call it's usually all farmland, and, and it's flooded frequently in the springtime. And it leaves a lot of folks that live out on Springtown Road um, pretty isolated for, for a while. Um, if you hit the button one more time, um, or twice, another one. Just one acre of wetland, getting back to the idea of holding flood water, one acre of wetland can store over a million gallons of flood water. So you can think about, you know, we know the trend has shown that we've lost wetlands over time. And loss of those wetlands has also left us with less ability to hold flood water. Um, and over the, you know, the entire United States, it's estimated that the damages from flooding is in the neighborhood of two to four billion dollars a year. Um, so we're spending a lot of money on the effects of flooding, and it's, you know, and, and one of the uh, tools in the solution bag is, you know, is protecting wetlands that can hold flood water. Next slide. And so what else has some of the research shown us again? Like I said, I don't want to get too bogged down in the science, but um, some researchers were suggesting that, you know, when we talk about a half or a quarter acre wetland here, quarter acre wetland there, it might not seem significant, but when you think about the cumulative impacts of losing a lot of small wetlands on the landscape, it can lead to a different story, like things like um, downstream flooding, for example, or offsite flooding, when we lose a lot of smaller wetlands that have the capacity to really hold flood water. And that was up in Greene County, um, I think in the kind of in the Palinville area, that photo there, after the storms last spring, and all the, you know, the farmland was just devastated. Next slide. Okay, so we so they are wetlands are like filters in the way they they remove the bad stuff. They're like bathtubs, the way they hold water. They're also really important for the water um, we drink in terms of groundwater recharge and groundwater discharge. In the town of Socrates, are all of you? Well, I know I'm, I'm guessing the village you might have municipal water. Is that true? But are, are there a lot of and then are there a lot of um, in wells too? And so yeah, particularly for well, you know, people drinking from wells. Um, or if there's municipal wells, groundwater is very important. Next slide. And so, <clears throat> excuse my very simplified um, illustrations, but if that's a wetland in the center there, the idea is that some wetlands, they do receive and hold water and slowly let it get into the groundwater. And then by doing so, they can recharge our groundwater. Um, and, you know, if we have a whole lot of rain and it's just moving across the landscape in sheets, you know, especially in paved areas or um, or, you know, communities where there's a lot of development and there's rooftops, the water, storm water, just moving across the landscape quickly. It's great if we can get into a wetland and actually sit there and slowly get back into the ground where, where we need it for supplying um, drinking water. Some wetlands, however, actually discharge groundwater. So they're like spring-fed wetlands where water's actually coming out of the ground and emerging through a wetland, and they're really important for um, source water. And, and these are often the wetlands that are at headwaters of streams, or they're um, providing water to um, streams that otherwise might be dry in, in the summertime, for example. And so they're keeping water levels um, a little bit more consistent by enabling groundwater to come out of um, you know, underground storage and come to the surface. Next slide. OK. Another, another benefit of wetlands is the fact that they actually can contribute to mosquito control. A lot of um, you know, folks, and, and I know I've lived near wetlands, and sometimes when you live near less than high quality wetlands in particular, you really can get um, a nuisance mosquito populations. But, next slide, um, if you have, in this case, um, you know, here we have a nice big beautiful healthy wetland. Um, if you have a nice healthy wetland, sorry Karen, I think there's a number of, let's try clicking at once. You'll have in a healthy wetland, right yeah. You'll have the suite of species that are associated with a healthy wetland. Things like our invertebrates that live in the water, like predaceous diving beetles, back swimmers, um, dragonfly and damselfly larvae um, developing in the water, as well as amphibians. And this natural um, uh, food web will help control mosquito populations. If you hit it one more time, there's a great little graphic. <laughs> they actually try to help eliminate some of those mosquitoes. It's when wetlands are ditched or they're uh, filled a little bit, and we end up with areas, pockets of sand and water, 
where we alter the natural um, kind of uh, rise and, and uh, drop of the water level, things that are part of that natural system, that's when we actually see increases in uh, mosquito populations. You know, when we create stagnant pools in wetlands, because maybe we've ditched it or we've done something to alter that natural hydrology. So um, getting back to some of the research, uh, one study in North Dakota found there were many more mosquitoes, like I just described, in degraded wetlands than in higher quality wetlands. The authors concluded, and this is what has some significance for communities, that preservation of healthy wetlands, unpolluted by excessive urban stormwater runoff or sedimentation, should be a vital concern to the public and to mosquito control agencies. So these you know, researchers are actually finding wetland conservation is actually beneficial to controlling mosquitoes. It kind of flips around kind of our, you know, what, what uh, a lot of people have as a misconception about um, the relationship between wetlands and mosquitoes. Next slide. And money, you know, gosh, with all of the uh, economic planning that's going on in the Hudson Valley, of course, this is always on, you know, everybody's mind. And recreation um, and um, nature-based, you know, tourism are such good economic engines for so many parts of the Hudson Valley. And wetlands also have a role in this. Next slide. Um, this is a study that um, is done every five years by the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's called the National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation. Just in New York, and this was, and I'm very excited because this, uh, this report will be out in August for 2011, so we'll see more recent data. But from 2006, not even looking at hunting and fishing, there were three and a half million wildlife watchers, just folks going out and, and enjoying wildlife in, in the state of New York. Um, two and a half million of those folks were uh, bird watchers, and you know, if you're a bird watcher, you know, wetlands are a great place to go and enjoy nature and enjoy bird watching. Um, but that activity resulted in over one and uh, 1.4 billion dollars in retail sales with multiplier effects, uh, over 25,000 jobs, and um, lots of money in tax revenues. So there's benefits to having these natural places that people want to go out and you know enjoy nature, recreate, um, hunt, fish, bird watch, and so forth. So um, while you know forests and meadows and other and streams and other habitats factor into this enjoyment of the outdoors, wetlands are certainly a part of this um, kind of economic benefit. And then wetlands are really important for habitat. And um, the, uh, I think this was, yeah, this is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the EPA, mentioned that although wetlands cover only about 5% of land in the lower 48 of the U.S., they're only 5% of that land, but they're home to over 31% of plant species. So they're really important for um, maintaining our different plant diversity. And approximately one half of all North American bird species nests or feed in wetlands. So wetlands are really important for the life cycles of many animals, and they're very important for supporting a diversity of plant life as well. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates up to 43% of threatened and endangered species rely on wetlands either directly or, or indirectly for, for their survival. And um, this, this, if you haven't figured it out, if you didn't identify the salamanders in that illustration, those are spotted salamanders. Um, that was drawn for me by a 4-H group in Ulster County that I had talked to about wet vernal pools and salamanders. And I think that they're also the reason why we should be conserving wetlands because these kids, you know, have every right, uh, I think, to enjoy and benefit from these wetlands that we've all been enjoying and benefiting um, from for so long. And so I feel, you know, that's, that's a, one more motivator for conserving wetlands as the future generations. So how do we conserve wetlands? Um, next slide. I want to talk a little bit about kind of some of the trends that are threatening wetlands, but then also talk about which ones are protected and why and which ones aren't. So uh, this was some research done back in 2003 by the Brookings Institute. And uh, basically they concluded that um, the Hudson Valley population um, was growing between 8 and 9% between 1982 and 1997. So here we have human population growth on the left, and land urbanization on the right. And while population only grew between 8 to 9%, the rate of urban land cover increased by 29%. And so it was really what they found was our use of land was much um, greater rate than our population was actually growing. It was an inefficient use of land. And um, that can often be referred to as sprawl because we're just not really using land efficiently to, um, to kind of reflect the size of the population. And poorly planned development can certainly threaten uh, some of our natural systems, including wetlands, and the functions and services that wetlands provide to us. Next slide. 
So here are some statistics. Uh, New York um, statewide has an estimate, uh, estimated 2.5 million acres of freshwater wetlands, which I've been talking about tonight. Also 25,000 acres of tidal wetlands. Those are the wetlands along um, the shoreline of the Hudson River. Between 1985 and 1995, New York had a net gain of approximately 15,000 acres of freshwater wetlands. So a lot of people think, well, why are we so worried about wetland protection if we actually had a net gain of wetlands? Well, if we look into the, um, the report a little bit further, it found that about 37,000 acres of wetlands during that 10-year time period in New York were gained primarily from agriculture being abandoned um, and reverting back to wetlands. So we, you know, we, we see, we've seen that trend, right, of losing agricultural activity. Over those 10 years, there was some agricultural lands deserted and they, they went back to wetlands. Next. Um, but they also found that 22,000 acres of wetlands were lost, primarily due to development, um, so changing the land use, um, but also probably resumed agricultural activity. One more slide. And those net losses, looking at the state of New York, the net losses of wetlands actually occurred in the Hudson Valley. And you know, the Hudson Valley is a great place to live, and there's a lot of pressure um, to, um, you know, to accommodate growing communities. And so by having things like a habitat map, an open space plan, a comprehensive plan, and hopefully a, you know, some sort of wetland protection in your community, you can prevent the losses that are going to impact your community you know, in the ways that would affect things like drinking water, flood water control, wildlife habitat, and so forth. So which wetlands are protected? That's another question I'm often asked. Well, why does a town need to protect wetlands? Uh, the federal government protects wetlands, and our state government protects wetlands. Well, that's true, but only to uh, a certain degree. For the most part, uh, if we were to generalize, New York State protects what we call larger wetlands. I'll talk about that. Um, and recent changes to federal jurisdiction left many isolated wetlands vulnerable. By isolated, I mean they're not connected to, um, by their definition, a navigable waterway, a stream or river. I think I get into more detail in the next slide. Right, so what does New York State protect? Just remember that previous slide. Generally, what I'm saying is larger wetlands are protected by New York, and isolated wetlands are not protected by federal government. Um, so New York State protects freshwater wetlands that are over 12.4 acres, which is five hectares, with a 100-foot adjacent area. And they'll also protect smaller wetlands that are considered of unusual local importance. That usually means a wetland where there's a um, threatened or endangered species. Long Island has used the unusual local importance designation for a lot of wetlands where uh, there are rare species. And they're on the freshwater wetlands map. It has to be on the New York State freshwater wetlands map in order to be protected by New York State. That's the way the law was written, and that's the way the DEC has to implement um, that law. So, um, so anything that's less than 12.4 acres, unless it has this ULI designation, um, or it's not on the map, it's not protected. So over 12.4 acres, and it has to be on the map, or it has that special designation. So um, that same trend study that I, I talked about a, a couple of slides ago suggested that our New York State regulatory maps, the ones that DEC uses, um, were outdated. And many wetlands over 12.4 acres were not depicted on those maps, and therefore not subject to protection or jurisdiction by DEC. So that's a fact of life, and that's something that that gap in wetland protection is something that can be filled by local communities um, uh, conserving wetlands uh, at the town level. Next slide. Okay, that was what New York State protects. What does the United States protect? So as I mentioned, and this is, um, you know, if, if you really want to get into the details, uh, Army Corps of Engineers are the ones to consult on what's um, within their jurisdiction. But by definition, the U.S. protects navigable waters and interstate waters, as well as the wetlands that are adjacent to those, um, and relatively permanent waters and wetlands that abut those. So permanent waters, major waterways, wetlands that are associated with those. Um, a lot of um, smaller wetlands uh, basically fall through the cracks. And because of the recent change in um, uh, the regulation, small isolated wetlands that are not connected to these larger waterways are not protected. And because they're not protected by New York, because they're small and they're isolated, they fall through the cracks of regulation. Next slide. Oh, sorry, one more. So um, my colleagues did a little bit of analysis. When, when the, the federal government changed its uh, protections, 
they tried to see, okay, well, if we were to look at all the wetlands in the Hudson Valley that would be considered too small for DEC to protect, and they were too isolated for the, um, the U.S. to protect, they found that 61% of our wetlands are basically unprotected in, in, um, El in Ulster County. I think if you hit it one more time. And for those of you not familiar, the terms palustrine and riverine wetlands, those are referring to categories of wetlands on the National Wetland Inventory Map. And they include, those two categories include freshwater marshes, swamps, ponds, and freshwater wetlands associated with rivers and streams. A lot of those wetlands I showed you in the very beginning, the hardwood swamp, the emergent marsh, all, like 61% of those in Ulster County are not protected by New York State or by the U.S. Next slide. So the Center for Watershed Protection was looking at these sorts of trends and this, these conditions throughout the United States. And they concluded that development in urban and rural areas now is the cause of more than 60% of national wetland loss. Several national assessments have noted deficiencies in the current federal and state regulatory programs. And they recommend that these regulatory gaps can best be closed by increased local management and regulation of wetlands. So this is not, you know, particular to New York State. This is a national trend where we see that the state and federal uh, protections are not always adequate enough to capture all the important wetlands, and that local management and regulation is a piece of that puzzle that can uh, really conserve wetlands. So um, any municipalities in the Hudson Valley have actually already passed their own wetland and water course ordinances. This is, um, if you're not familiar, I feel like I look at this 10-county map so frequently, it's like the back of my hand, but... Here, down here, we have Rockland and Westchester counties. Here's Orange. Here's Ulster. And above it, going up in the center, here's the Hudson River, going up to Albany and Rensselaer counties. And you'll see in um, you know, some of the areas that have been feeling the pressure of population growth and development for a long time, like Westchester and Putnam, they all have a lot of, or they already have wetland and watercourse protections on their books. Dungeness County um, has quite a few as well. And then when we get up toward the capital region, in Ulster County, uh, the town of Woodstock, your neighbor, is one of the only that have it now. But um, the town's, uh, town of New Paltz, I need to fill in uh, solid blue now, passed theirs. Gardner is working on one. And now, and now you, you know, town of Saugerties as well is working on local wetland conservation. So we like to see that. Um, we love to see this turn uh, more you know, blue, both um, metaphorically and uh, on the map as well. So uh, to, to conclude, um, in addition to the local wetland laws, there's other ways we can incorporate wetland protection into um, our kind of overall pr approach. And one is just taking a big picture view. All of those services I talked about, water filtration, water storage, um, uh, recreation, those are all services. We call them ecosystem services. They're actually benefits we get from our natural systems. If you think about your town in that big picture view, you can help maintain those services so that the community can continue to benefit from those and not um, need to use tax dollars to try to create mechanisms to get those benefits from built infrastructure. Um, learning where important resources are located in your community, I think Town of Saugerties is already way ahead of a lot of communities in that regard. Using plans and zoning to guide conservation and land use decisions, um, that's really important. Uh, you know, a lot of times plans are created, and it's a shame when they collect dust or um, there's turnover on boards and commissions and people aren't made aware that there's this great tool that we should be using to inform our decisions. Um, and considering wetland and habitat conservation early in the planning process so that it's not a um, you know very late in the game kind of uh, news flash for uh, an applicant or a developer to find out, oh, there's a really important wetland or habitat on the site that you're interested in building on. It's much easier if they know about that early on. And so when you have maps, and you have plans, and you've identified those places, it makes a much more predictable um, process when it comes to um, development as well as conservation. Asking good questions during the State Environmental Quality Review during Seeker um, is another opportunity to think about these resources. And finally, um, educating the community, which it's wonderful that you're um, taping tonight's program and, um, and offering these public forums for people to learn a little bit more about the resources that are uh, such, of such high value. So just to conclude, um, take home messages. I can't you know, emphasize enough that wetlands just have tremendous value. It's not just about wildlife habitat, although of course I love biodiversity and I, and, and I think that's a really important reason why uh, we should protect wetlands. But they're so 
valuable to our community is just from um, you know, the perspective of keeping our communities livable and, and healthy. Um, many wetlands are not protected, as I said, by state and federal regulations, so there certainly is a role for local communities to fill in the gaps of protection and make sure that we have you know, a um, healthy landscape that can, that can provide all the services we talked about. So I think that's it. And um, I know that Karen also has a presentation, but if there's time for questions, or Pat, did you want to wait until we were all done? Uh, no, we can, uh, if anybody has any questions right now for Laura, uh, we can bring them up. Uh, or if not, I'll be here for a while, <laughs> if you want to talk to me after. Great. Well, thank you all so much for your attention. <laughs>
Um, water resources are also of concern because they're affected by a number of land use activities uh, that affect them and that also affect the larger watershed. These are some of the examples of land use activities and their effects um, on these resources. Uh, they include some of the things that uh, Laura mentioned, changes in recharge and discharge, changes in impervious surfaces, changes in stream flow or water quality, changes in pond and wetland water levels and cycles, sedimentation and erosion, habitat loss, changes in temperature, bank destabilization, erosion, and of course, flooding. Just as a, a, another example, water quality impacts um, are dispersed throughout the system, and a lot of these impacts are hard to see. The chart here uh, lists some of the chemical constituents just in stormwater runoff, um, just one type, uh, a source of uh, water quality degradation for water resources. And as you can see there, there are a lot of them, and most of them you can't even see in the water, so it's hard to tell whether they're there or whether they're not there. <clears throat> to return to this question, because it's very, very important, um, a lot of people strongly believe that water resources don't need additional protection because they're already protected. And I'm going to go through this part a little more quickly. Um, but I've included stormwater management because um, stormwater management serves a very important purpose, but it isn't the same as protection for water resources in the way that we look at it with a water resource protection law. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't normally look at water resources as natural systems. It looks at them as conveyances of flood water and runoff. Maybe a subtle difference, but I think a, a big difference. Um, and those are just some other examples. Um, stormwater management is sometimes used uh, as mitigation for impacts on other water resources, and it really isn't designed to serve that function. <clears throat> as Laura mentioned, the federal government uh, does protect some wetlands. I wanted to emphasize here, uh, a lot of people talk about federal wetland maps. They really do not exist. Um, the wetlands that are under the Corps of Engineers jurisdiction um, are not mapped. What we do have are the National Wetland Inventory Maps, which are essentially wetland habitats. And they don't include all the wetlands that are under Corps protection. I also want to mention here, because a question came up earlier <clears throat> about mapping, um, it's really difficult to show wetlands accurately on maps. That's why we do wetland delineations. And wetland delineations are very specific activities where there's a person on the ground, trudging around through wetlands, and flagging the boundaries of that wetland on the ground. That is really the only way to tell on a particular part <coughs> exactly where the wetlands are. Um, it, a maps, maps will give you a good idea of where, but where to look for wetlands or where there, there may be wetlands, but they will not give you the boundaries that you need when you are guiding people in where to place their homes and their roads. Next. And the BBC, of course, protects wetlands as we have already seen. Okay. Now, the frogs in this illustration are, are very optimistic. Um, you know, but I'm sure they're going to have kind of a hard time of it. Um, mitigation is also something to be really careful about when we're talking about water resources protection. Um, first and foremost, mitigation means avoidance. It means avoiding those impacts when you can, rather than trying to fix them after you've already done them. Um, and it does kind of lull you into a false sense of security like these frogs believing that you can just put a swamp anywhere, uh, because in fact you can't. Um, very often, you cannot duplicate the wetland functions and values to the extent that they were carried out by the original wetland or stream. To do that, 
it's usually a very high cost endeavor. So these are all things to kind of keep it in the back of your mind when you hear about mitigation. So let's get into the water resource protection laws themselves. Um, these laws are crafted for a specific purpose. As I mentioned before, the first step in looking at these laws is what are you trying to why? But they're also a collaborative effort between the science community, local government, and citizens who work together to protect the resources, protect the water resources, while also encouraging well-planned economic development and its streamlining regulatory review processes. So that it's very possible by adopting a local water resource protection law to actually streamline some of the regulatory processes when you're looking at wetlands. Rather than just adding on another layer, these laws can actually be designed to make the process easier for someone to navigate in your town. Okay, okay so what do these laws basically contain? Uh, the the Socrates law uh, follows this general outline um, along with all of the other water resource protection laws that are on the books. As I mentioned before, and I want to stress again, what you're trying to protect and why. Then, <clears throat> looking at those activities on the land that affect water resources and create a need for protection. In other words, what are you trying to protect water resources from? And then thirdly, how are you going to do that? We'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail in the next slides. Okay, first of all, the purpose of the law, very hard, I mean, very, very important to keep uh, up front at all times, identifying water resources that are protected by the law, why they're important, how the ten town will benefit from protecting these water resources, and then in some way talking about the water resource functions and values. Um, providing in the law a sound scientific basis for protection. This, this kind of protection is not arbitrary. It's based on science. And that's very important to include when people may challenge you or ask you, why are you protecting these resources? What do they do? Next. <clears throat> also, and this may seem remedial, but it's very important to define the terms that you're using in a water resource so that everybody is talking about the same thing. Um, the most, with one of the key definitions is the definition of the areas that you're trying to regulate. Um, what are resources? What are they? And they're buffers. What are the buffers? Again, very important in order for people to understand exactly what is being protected. As Laura went into much more detail about, uh, wetlands defined typically have the vegetation, the soils, and the hydrology that makes them wetlands. Any good wetland delineator knows that. Those are the things that you have to look for out in the field. And those are the criteria that have to be met by any wet place out in the landscape in order for it to be considered a true wetland. It isn't just any puddle or, you know, or any arbitrary place. There's Specific scientific parameters that you have to look for and that you have to find before you can consider it a weapon. Next. Buffers. Now, buffers, buffers generate a lot of confusion for people because they aren't exactly the wet part of the water resource, but they're the strips of land that lie around water resources and that effectively protect them from some of the land use activities that we've talked about before that can cause impacts on water quality, habitat, um, on water level, on, on all of those different things. Um, again, this is not arbitrary when you're putting together a water resources protection law. There are specific guidelines for how big to make a buffer. Um, for example, a 10-foot buffer around a wetland isn't going to do very much. Um, as you can see in that picture down in the far uh, bottom right hand corner, um, <clears throat> that's a wetland that someone is trying to protect uh, with basically no buffer. And as you can see, it's 
going to kind of be a losing proposition. Um, so the, the important thing here with buffers is to match them to the water resource benefit that you're trying to protect. Are you trying to protect habitat or water quality or um, erosion protection? And then to also remember that buffer effectiveness is going to be determined by the size of the buffer, what's growing in it, what the slope of the land is. Obviously, water is going to run down a steep slope a lot faster and tend to erode a lot easier than it will um, on a level area. Um, so these are some of the things to keep in mind when you're looking at buffers. The 100-foot buffer um, comes from a number of research examples from the Environmental Law Institute and the Center for Watershed Protection. And I apologize for that. I don't know what happened to some of these slides in translation here. But, um, but of all of the studies and research that were uh, reviewed in, these, in some recent publications from the Environmental Law Institute, they, they found that about 80 feet uh, of a buffer was necessary for nutrient and pollutant removal, uh, 100 feet for micro, microclimate regulation and sediment removal, 160 feet for detrital input and bank stabilization. That is for generating the leaves and other detritus that that find their way from the surroundings of a water resource into the water and are used by aquatic organisms. And then at least 300 feet for wildlife habitat, again, depending on the species. Some may require more. So 100 feet really is a pretty good, um, a pretty good size for a buffer to achieve uh, a fairly well-rounded level of protection. Again, for habitat, sometimes you may need but land use activities then that do not affect buffer functions are permitted within the buffer. So buffers are not areas where you can't do anything. But they're areas that are protected by the water resources protection law where there's, there are certain activities um, that you can't do within buffers because they'll keep the buffer from doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, now we're going to get into looking at the activities that affect water resources, kind of the heart of a water resources protection law. Those things that, uh, what are you protecting water resources from? And these are activities that, that occur on the land. There are regulated activities for which you're going to require a permit. Actions that are exempt from permits because they're not going to have a negative effect on water resources. And prohibited, prohibited actions those actions that are so damaging to water resources that they're just flat prohibited. Um, when towns look at what kinds of activities to regulate, it's important to match them up by looking at land use activities, like you have here on the left hand side, for specific things that happen on the land, construction, permitted services, removal of vegetation, water contamination, changes to drainage patterns, and then across the top, the water resource benefits that may be affected by some of those land use activities. And by trying to match those two things up, helps you get a better idea in the water resources protection law of which actions you want to list under all three of those categories, regulated, exempt, or prohibited. Okay, next in the law, you have to talk about, okay, for activities that require a permit, what do you do? What are the steps that you're going to have to follow when you apply for a permit? What kind of information does the town need for permit evaluation? Um, and how do you, you know, well, how does that entire process work? Uh, very important. It's important for that to be clear, and it's important for it to be consistent so that every project is evaluated the same way. Also important for uh, clarity and consistency is standards for permit decisions. This is important to include in a water resource protection law so that you are evaluating all projects the same and you're using the same parameters, the same criteria to review and to evaluate each project that comes your way. Um, this also goes back to that original understanding of water resource functions 
and land use activity impacts. Next is the impl implementation of the Water Resources Protection Law. Uh, the permit and application forms, reviews, and enforcement. Uh, the, the teeth of the law, uh, that which makes it have some weight in the community and actually be able to achieve its goals of water resource protection. And then, <clears throat> kind of at the end, but not really at the end of all this, it's very important to think about the cost of not protecting water resources. What do we stand to lose if they're not protected? What would it take to restore resources that have been damaged or degraded as opposed to what would it take to protect them in the first place? Next. And I always put this at the end of my talks because I think it's one reason why we're here, why we're doing this, what is our heritage, what is our legacy to future generations, and how can we help leave things in a better state than we found them. And that is the conclusion. And thank you very much for your time. that you pick up, but also on the um, website itself. Uh, it's actually uh, cpc, what is it, at Socrates dot ny dot us, thank you. That's what happens when you have it, you know, automatically in your machine, you don't really read it and have to stroke it in every time. But uh, that's where you will be able to see or even uh, uh, get a hold of a hard copy of this uh, proposed uh, zoning law. Uh, question? How I have a, a statement. I want to thank the committee for working with for those endeavors. Years, years ago, we tried a moratorium. We asked for a moratorium on building when these were very important to those of us in the community. So, it was a zilch. You know how hard it is to get anything done fast. We have our septic system cleaned every three years to make sure that our water is protected on our property. And uh, up, and the lands that uh, go into the reservoir should be protected. There's also underground water in this area, especially coming off the mountains. There are areas up uh, coming off the mountain where you can go down six to eight feet and get creek cobbles. In other words, years ago, that's where the water came down to start into the Hudson. Those drainage fields are still there 
according to the geological studies around here. And also it's good to protect the water here because it's eventually going into the Hudson. And we want to keep the Hudson clean too. So I want to thank the committee for your endeavors and I wish you all the luck in the world. Your luck will be my luck. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I, uh, well, we have one more question. Susan, hold on. When is this going to be shown on, on Lighthouse TV? And can we get DVD copies of this, these talks if we want? Did you get that question, Leanne? Yes. Um, Miriam, you'll be taking the, the program back and probably next week at the earliest. Probably. It'll be listed on uh, the website. It'll be listed in the newspapers. And, uh, I mean, we can run this because... We're always looking for great programming, and this is this is an excellent program. And Laura also brought uh, another program about wetlands that we're going to be showing. So I think what we'll do is show both back to back. We'll do this program plus the other one, and try to put it on, you know, as many times as we can for the next couple. I'd say all of July and August, you know. So it'll be be there. DVDs available? I would say, uh, you know, we could probably have several burned. I'll ask that if TV23 can burn some of them. And then... Uh, Only two. Two? Okay. Uh, the DVD that I brought and gave Leanne is, um, was a documentary that was developed by the New Paul's Wetland Education Fund Advisory Committee. They were charged with trying to educate uh, the community about wetlands and decided to take the route of um, getting a local filmmaker to develop this uh, doc documentary. And actually one of your uh, residents, Spider Barber, is in the documentary along with... Um, the director of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, uh, Michael Clemens. There's a number of scientists interviewed. Um, and the focus is really not just on New Paul's. It's really about um, a lot of what we talked about tonight. Um, but it's done in a very visually nice way with you know, music, and, and it's a nice 25-minute, concise uh, little program about wetland protection. So. Thank you. Have any other questions? Last question, please. Thank you. Anything else? Mary? 
Okay. Uh, we appreciate everyone who came, and especially our presenters. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Karen. Um, and this kind of wraps us up. The only thing I'm going to do is ask that uh, my committee members kind of hold on here for about five minutes. I want to just kind of go over something briefly with them. So if you want to wrap up and go. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.